Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome very much, or welcome to this event that we're having today uh, in conjunction with our partners at the, the Central Asia program. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Bennett Clifford. I'm a research fellow at the Program on Extremism, also here at George Washington University. Uh, we have been uh, in the planning stages of this event for what seems like about a year and a half now, and we're very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to have uh, this uh, truly all-star panel of uh, scholars of Central Asia uh, and extremism uh, on board for, for this event today. Uh, I'll start uh, down at uh, your far left uh, is Dr. Marlene Laruel, who's the director of the Central Asia program at GW, as well as the associate director for the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the Elliott School here at GW. Uh, one down, we have uh, Noah Tucker, who is senior editor for the Uzbek service at Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, as well as an associate at the Central Asia program. Uh, and uh, to my immediate right is Dr. Edward Lemon, uh, who is the Kennan Institute Fellow at the Daniel Morgan Graduate School, as well as a Global Fellow at the Wilson Center. So today's event will focus on uh, countering violent extremism programming in Central Asia. And one of the major topics that we'll be discussing today is sort of the cacophony of various actors that have been involved in countering violent extremism programming since, uh, I would argue, looking at the start of the Syrian civil conflict uh, in 2012, 2013. Uh, the increase in resources devoted to countering violent extremism programming, but more importantly, the number of actors at multiple levels, uh, whether it's looking at uh, international actors, national actors, regional actors, and then uh, down at the bottom, the, the local actors as well. Uh, and also navigating between governmental actors on one hand and non-governmental actors. Between each of these uh, stakeholders involved in countering violent extremism programming, navigating some of the discrepancies in how they view these types of programs, uh, how resources should be spent, uh, which types of programs should be pursued, how should they be implemented, uh, can sometimes uh, be of some difficulty and result in either contradictory or uh, misguided programming uh, that lacks uh, the ability, in some cases, uh, to be measured, in some cases uh, resulting in contradictory effects as well. Uh, and this is also negotiating between the frameworks of the traditional law enforcement and military focused counterterrorism programming uh, on one hand and uh, the preventative whole of society countering violent extremism programming on the other as well. Before we get into uh, some of the facets of this dynamic, uh, I will quickly turn the floor over to Dr. LaRuel who will give us some comments about the state of play regarding uh, religious political identity in Central Asia and how some of these factors play into how countering violent extremism programming uh, is developed. Um, so I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> yeah, I was asked to give some introductory remark on the region and these issues of extremism, and I would like to make two uh, main points. The first one is that, as you may know, for Central Asia, the context is that of uh, uh, relatively authoritarian regimes with the exception of Kyrgyzstan, but I would say that Kyrgyzstan is 
less authoritarian than its neighbor, not because Kyrgyz elites really believe in democratic values, but because they are too weak to be authoritarian. So it's more <coughs> the case of a failed authoritarian regime than something <coughs> else, sorry. But what is really unifying all these regimes, it's to function on, on uh, endemic corruption, kleptocratic clientelism, uh, 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 mechanism. So when you look at the literature on extremism in the region, you have two kind of way of reading it. Some people are saying extremism is on the rise in Central Asia because of this authoritarian strong state that don't give any space to religious freedom. And you have another part of the literature that say that extremism is on the rise because this is, these are failing states. So you have this kind of contradiction to know if extremism is rising because these states are too strong or these states are too weak, right? And in fact, it can be both of them because what is sure is that rich or poor, failed authoritarian, authoritarian or not, all these states compared to the Soviet Union have been failing in providing welfare services, especially in rural region. So a lot of all are facing a lot of social economic issues, huge poverty gaps, lack of prospect, lack of job, lack of simple things like transportation. So in rural region, you really have people who just can't leave the, the, the region because of this lack of public transportation. And also something that we tend to forget to mention, but I think is really critical is that a lot of the rural regions and small cities of Central Asia have just become cultural desert. I mean, you just have nothing to do there. There is very few sports structure. There is no more cinema, no more theater, no more whatever, right? So, so I think that's an important element compared to what the, the Soviet regimes was trying to develop in the region. So that's a very general uh, uh, first point I wanted to make. The second one is that when we are discussing counter-extremism programs in the region, I'm not sure what we are really trying to counter. And I think that's one of the big issues is the definition of what we are countering and what means extremism. This definition of violent extremism is very ambiguous, as many of you may, may know, and there have been a lot of discussion in that. I think there is extremism in thinking, in many aspects among some Central Asians. That doesn't mean that there is extremism in action. Then you can have a lot of violence that I wouldn't identify as extremist. So here I think we have a, a lot of ambiguity and that partly explains the difficulties in building some uh, uh, articulated programs. We have globally, and I think uh, uh, Ed, we developed on that, a quite low level of terrorist attack or violence uh, or, or any kind of Islamic related violence in the region, right? And so contrary to what many people in this town were trying to say a few years ago, there is no spillover from Afghanistan, for example. The level of terrorist attack for the region is quite low if you compare it with uh, other region of the world. So in that case, what are we countering in terms of extremism? I mean, I think the, the case of Kazakhstan, which is the country that faced a series of terrorist attacks between 2011 and 2016 is maybe the one that seems to fit more the kind of classic definition of, of uh, violent extremism, but I still think it should be, it's open to question. Very often you have violence in the region whose religious character and link to Islamism is the dubious. And I would say on many aspects we are more talking about criminal issues to be solved and fight between some criminal group and some security services in the region that's some, something related to uh, uh, Islamic terrorism. So here also, how do we want to counter extremism? And in fact, it's countering criminal organized group. It's another logic. And then maybe the only element where Central Asia had a noticeable trend was the level of departure for the Syrian uh, war theater. And, and both uh, Noah and Ed will be talking on that more. So I think, and that would be my last point, I think we are conflating three issues. One is radicalization of Central Asian who left and are le the region and are living abroad in diaspora. And in that case, the issues of kind of countering their radicalization has to happen here in our society. It's, a, it's an issue of Western, how Western societies are able to integrate or not to integrate their migrants. So I think in a sense, Central Asia is partly outside this framework of radicalization in diaspora. 
The second is this phenomenon of, so the terrorist attack we had in Kazakhstan, few others, but very, in a very limited number, and uh, uh, the, phenomen, uh, the phenomenon of fighters to Syria, where I think the real issues are about social economic the situation in very depressed region, and the fact that it's, if you look sociologically, it's mostly young men without any job prospect or just any kind of prospect in life who have been shifting to uh, uh, the, this impression that either fighting abroad or participating in criminal activity that then will be connected on one way to another with some radical uh, uh, Islamic group. So that's the kind of the, the main trend. And in that case, the answer has to be social, economic, and cultural, and not so much about <coughs> religion or, or Islam. And then the third phenomenon is the cultural Islamization globally of Central Asian societies. And I think that is the real transformative element that all the Central Asian states at different levels and under different conditions are facing. That's where you have a growing horizontal societal pressure on people to try to follow what is becoming a more and more normative definition of Islam. But here there is no extremism, there is no violence, and if there is something to counter, it's clearly not coming. It shouldn't be coming from Western NGOs arriving with their model. So I think the problem is this kind of overlap of confusing the cultural Islamization going on in the region with very limited terrorist action and uh, uh, that are mostly probably have a very strong social economic aspect and this radicalization in diaspora. And I think that partly explains what you were explaining at the West Ben was explaining at the beginning, this kind of melting pot of, of uh, uh, stakeholders and different programming that are not well coordinated because each of them is coming with something, a specific definition of what should be targeted. And I will just stop here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Laruel. Uh, some important comments there as well to think about in terms of the, the overall state of play, uh, why some of these defini definitional issues can result in uh, policies that in, in some cases result in uh, problematic outcomes as well and trying to look more carefully at uh, some of those procedures as well. Um, floor is all yours, Noah. Okay, thank you. Um, that would be difficult to follow up because <laughs> that was, um, well, and you really touched on many of the, the most important things that we have to bring to this. Um, and I, um, I, I fully agree with all of this. And I, I think I will take, um, I'll try to take sort of a sub-aspect of, of all of these things. Um, to talk about uh, the third of the misperceptions that you mentioned about cultural Islamization and how this is being conflated and mistaken for terrorism and a non-violent extremism that is not differentiated from violent extremism, which as you said so well, most of the time turns out to be something else, not terrorist extremism, not ISIS. It's it's, um, it's drug trafficking networks, it's um, petty criminality, it's mafia, and this sort of thing, that then um, in a kind of, after a kind of fashion, because it's very, it looks very badass at this point to associate yourself with ISIS or with something like this, that they, um, they adopt a style um, in that way without really any of the substance or driving ideology, and so it becomes it becomes easy to conflate these things, but if we're designing programs that are meant to be effective in preventing them, particularly when we're connected to violent crime, and this is a genuine problem that the state needs to address, um, it's, it is not helpful when we're trying, when we're treating these people as if they are, um, they're exactly the same as ISIS that arises in Iraq or something like that, when in reality there's something very, very different that likes to put on those clothes and style itself in that way. Um, but I'm in the, in the kind of awkward position now of having to give a presentation about two weeks before I begin a whole summer of people work. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm really happy um, to, to get to go and do new field work in the region, but also feel like I would much rather give a presentation in like three months <laughs> after we have collected all of these things and, and had a chance to explore some of the questions that we're looking at. But this has been a good opportunity um, to, to have the privilege to be involved in um, several um, sort of government and non-government projects in Central Asia that are 
helping to better design or are designed and intended to better design some of these counter-extremism or, or counter-terrorism measures. Um, one of the things that I've gotten to do over the past six months is meet quite frequently um, with government officials, particularly in Kyrgyzstan, and listen to what their perceptions of these things are and what their perceptions of what it is that we should be researching so that they can design programs to counter. And one of the things that has become immediately obvious is that, as Marlene suggested, we have very different ideas about what is going on here and what the roots of these problems are in many cases. And this raises sort of a question for me about whether or not we are, um, whether or not we are continuing to simply try to decouple religion from everything that is blamed for social problems in Central Asia in the same way that we were trying very hard 10 years ago and 15 years ago to try to get past this idea that just religion is bad and suspect and Islamization is very bad, you know, and, the, and this kind of thing too. It, it is at some times very, um, it's very frustrating to be honest to go to meeting after meeting and hear over and over again about how the sign that terrorism, that there's a threat of terrorism to Central Asia is that many more women are wearing hijab. You know, this is, I, I would have thought at times that we had finally gotten past that point where we could say, okay, just the way that you dress is not indicative of being ready to murder someone, something like that. These are completely different things and completely different social processes. But I've started to think, um, as I've had time to, to talk to more people and, and um, think this through a little bit as we begin to try to design these new um, fieldwork instruments, that we are in sort of a different place. Um, and this is encouraging in a lot of ways, but it also means that we have a, a new problem that we may not be entirely prepared to solve or to confront. And this is that, um, in one of your other points, in, the, in that last point, um, that, that this, um, the Islamization and the social Islamization of Central Asia I think is sort of accepted um, in general as a clock that is not going to be turned back at this point. I think we have made some, um, th there has been uh, some positive movement toward moving away from a Soviet uh, and very um, reductivist Marxist understanding of what is religion and why people are religious and why people are attracted to these things to more of an acceptance that well, Uzbeks have been Muslims for hundreds of years, and it's probably normal for them to think of themselves as Muslims again now. And in some ways, Uzbekistan has taken a lead in promoting Islamic identity and reattaching um, sort of the Islamic values to governance and things like that, um, which, is, which is neither good nor bad from an external perspective. It is just to say it is in constructing policy <coughs> It's helpful not to see this confused for a straight line to terrorism. But one of the things that um, a, a kind of side problem that has arisen for this is that increasingly, I've found um, in my own time in the region and in talking to government officials, it's just my own impression, that um, there is a kind of new problem that has developed in which we now are struggling with the idea that there is only really one way to be a Muslim that there's one appropriate way to be a Muslim and that all of these other ways of being Muslim, and, and Islam is, a, is a, um, a very diverse and heterodox religion, and so um, there are always going to be many different ways of being Muslim, just like there are many different ways of being Christian. Um, but there is this real fear now when, when you see people practicing their faith in a slightly different way or doing something different, that there is a direct connection between this and terrorism. And I'm not sure how, you, how we imagine or how we think through that we get from A to B in this case. It has, we could talk probably for a long time and there could be whole papers written about how this works and what the, the assumptions are in this, but it, we'll pass those up for now and just say that they're there. And I, a, a 
really good piece of evidence for this, the one that's kind of, um, that's hit me most strongly about this is that as we talk about designing, um, as we talk about designing research, you know, what, what areas should we be looking for dangerous radicalization? Where should we be looking for terrorist recruitment to Syria or something like this? There is this um, real pressure in Kyrgyzstan, at least, on the part of conversations with some government officials, to say that, you know, this the group that we really need to be worried about is this group called Yakin Inkar. They say, forget about ISIS, forget about these others. Here in Chui, in the center of Kyrgyzstan, Yakin Inkar is everywhere. The, it's the spread of their ideology is everywhere. And so Yakin Inkar, if it does exist, is, um, uh, is held to be an offshoot of Tablighi Jamaat, a very um, common um, religious group in Kyrgyzstan that has a, a, a large number of followers and a lot of support on official levels and so has been generally protected from um, those officials who would prefer to, uh, to ban it or ensure that they are protecting people from, uh, from its influence. Um, it, it is primarily, for those who are not familiar with it, a group that, um, it's a proselytizing group. It's a Muslim revivalist group in the same way that evangelical Christian revivalists will have tent revivals and go around and, and try to, to convince people who they feel ought to be Christians as part of, say, American culture, or Midwestern American culture in the Bible Belt, to be better Christians and become practicing Christians, to go to church, to connect to these communities. Um, a lot of the activity of, um, of Tablighi Jamaat is aimed at this, is sort of um, convincing Muslims to be Muslims. And it's decidedly apolitical, um, but there are a number of people who are quite uncomfortable with it in Kyrgyzstan because they associate it with Pakistan, where the group was originally formed, although it has a very international presence. And they're concerned, they believe, that if groups like these and foreign religious influence somehow infects the population, that it will, um, in the words of a, a paper that I, I looked at yesterday, I think, if I'm paraphrasing correctly from Russian, it will destroy the social fabric of the country and harm our morality as a people, um, because we want things that are purely our own, that are our own Islam and not this other kind of Islam. And so there is this real, um, there is this real, and I think it's not comical, it's, it's genuine fear that a group like what they call Yakin and Kar, which, is, which are essentially people who choose to drop out of society and devote themselves to their own religious communities. They're, they don't watch television. And this is when you, when you ask, okay, Yakin and Kar, what are they? What's so scary about them? Well, they don't watch television and they don't send their children to schools. And so these both seem like, yes, they're very sort of, um, they're, they're, it's a demonstrable change. They're becoming quite different. But it's hard to see what the connection between these two things and joining a terrorist organization is. I'm not sure that not watching television makes it, you know, makes you more inclined to somehow move to Syria or join ISIS or something like that. And there's not sort of a serious argument this way. There's just this understanding that these two things, this kind of difference is, will lead to all kinds of difference and will eventually, the cognitive process is the same as John Heathershaw put it in a, in a panel we did at Oxford last week that I think was very helpful. And there's very little and actually no data to support this assumption, but Yakin and Carr is particularly interesting to me, um, although I have my doubts that it actually exists as a group. What we do have though are all over Central Asia, coming back to the the inequality and these cultural deserts and these sorts of things that you mentioned, an awful lot of people who are um, not just rediscovering their religious identity, but are doing it in a in a, a context of extreme inequality, and are coming to a point now, 27, 29 years after independence, where they no longer believe that they're going to be included in the national. Um, there are large numbers of communities out in the isolated areas of Western and Central Kazakhstan where people are turning to these kind of alternative religious beliefs, um, 
Madhali Salafism in most cases in, 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 in those areas, and in some cases more violent jihadist Salafism, more because they, as a kind of, either as a way of just dropping out of society because they no longer believe that they will be included in the project that is Almaty and Astana in Kazakhstan, or because they believe that they need to find a revolutionary expression to change everything so that they can be included and so that communities like theirs can be included. And it, to, um, it strikes me that, that treating people who drop out of society because they feel excluded and people who join revolutionary <laughs> movements um, is a very poor design for policy. It's likely to lead to things that are the opposite of what we want. Um, what the, the literature in social psychology and, and some research by um, a, a Scottish professor named Stephen Riker, whose work I'm starting to discover and I'm really interested in, um, have called co-radicalization that we need to look at the ways in which our policies do not create a vicious cycle there, where people already feel discriminated against and not part of, not included in the group. And if the government is then punishing them for not feeling included and for dropping out of society that they don't feel that they belong in, then this only widens the gap and creates really convenient talking points for these revolutionary groups that say, they're not going to accept you no matter what you do. And so what you need to do is overthrow the government instead of just dropping out of it. Um, so I will stop there and pass on to Ed. That's a very nuanced look at in a granular look. I would say it's some of these, I guess for lack of a better term, nonviolent uh, extremist movements in Central Asia. And uh, as we move into Dr. Levin's presentation, uh, one thing that's sort of emerging as one of the issues in sort of how uh, CB or countering extremism programs have been employed in the region is this lack of proportional response. Uh, understanding the scope of the threat and applying programs that respond directly uh, to just that while not overhyping or uh, assessing the threat uh, to a large percentage for groups where it may not exist as well. Uh, we'll move into Dr. Lemon's talk, which will focus, I believe, on uh, some of the policy ramifications of some of these decisions. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I think the advantage of going last is obviously that my two colleagues have taken many of the points that I was going to make. So I will keep this very brief so we can open it up to discussion. Um, sort of building off Mar what Marlene says, I think Central Asia really doesn't have, to a great extent, a problem with violent extremism, a problem with terrorism, but it has more of a problem with countering violent extremism, particularly countering violent extremism that's government-led. Uh, so um, according to my figures, since 2014, 143 people have died in terrorist attacks. That includes terrorists and government officials. In fact, the vast majority, I think all but eight of those individuals um, were either members of the terrorist group or members of sort of the uh, employees of the state. At the same time, one in every 10,000 citizens from the region um, has gone to fight in Syria. Syria and Iraq, or at least tried to go and fight in Syria and Iraq. We include those figures of those who were stopped at the border um, with Turkey trying to cross into Syria. So the scale of the problem, um, it's certainly there, and it's an issue, but at the same time as that's been going on, the government's response, you know, as a result of the government's response across the region, you know, thousands have been arrested. In Tajikistan, we've had two oppositional groups, Group 24 and IRPT, the Islamic Renaissance Party, that at the time sort of it was banned in 2015, was the leading independent sort of political party in the country. They've both been labeled extremist organizations and put in the same category as, or in the case of IRPT, a terrorist organization, they're put in the same category as the IMU and ISIS and all these other organizations. Kazakhstan has amended its religious law in 2018 to include very problematic categories such as a destructive religious movement, a religious radicalism, and, and creating legal concepts around those. As, um, as uh, Noah mentioned, Yakin Inkar was, uh, I think, labeled an extremist organization by Kyrgyzstan back in 2017. And despite the reforms and, and, and what's going on in Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan uh, introduced a new law, fight, the Fighting Extremism Act, midway through last year. Um, that creates the category of an extremist organization, and the Supreme Court and the Minister of Justice are in the process of compiling a list that, to my knowledge, having checked this morning, has not yet been published. So whereas we've had sort of certain hundreds of people killed um, and thousands sort of, sort of 8,000 radicalized, you know, many more people than that have been affected either directly by being arrested 
and certainly more broadly by being repressed and seeing their sort of rights restricted. I think the problem, as, as Noah has alluded to, is this criminalization of extremism within uh, domestic legislation. And this was really led by Russia. Um, so this week, in preparation for sort of some of our presentations, I, I, I took the laws on extremism from the Central Asian states and the 2002 law uh, from the Russian Federation, the first sort of country within post-Soviet space to create legislation on extremism. And the results of putting this through a plagiarism checker was that Tajikistan's legislation is 56% identical to the Russian. Um, Kyrgyzstan's is 79% identical to the Russian. Um, Sorry, identical to what? Identical wording, identical, identical wording within the within the law uh, on extremism. So that's two, Kyrgyzstan's 2005 law, Russia's 2002 law. Um, when we look at Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, uh, it's four percent and five percent. So there's, there's a greater variation there. When we look at the sort of what is either Article One or Article Three, which is definitions of extremism, the Kyrgyz figure jumps to eighty-two percent, the Tajik to sixty-eight percent, the Uzbek to twenty percent, and the Kazakh to thirteen percent. When we peel that back. And actually, when you read the wording of this definition of extremist, extremism, extremist activities, extremist group, extremist organization, you know, I think three, there are three commonalities between all of the definitions. Um, first is there's always some sort of reference to the forcible change to the foundation of the constitutional system. Um, second, there's some sort of reference to the incitement of social, racial, ethnic, and religious hatred. And third, that there's some sort of reference to the disruption of national security of the state. So it's very much set up in terms of um, uh, securitizing sort of difference, securitizing uh, uh, acts that sort of lie outside of state control um, and is very sort of amorphous and can be applied to various situations as it happens. Um, so I think that's really the, the underlying problem uh, in the region is really one of the criminalization of, of extremism. And I think that's always, the, as, as given that that's sort of view held by many within the governments and the view held within many in, in, in civil society as well. I think it's the, the challenge is to move beyond. And I think you know that, that's a very difficult task. And I think you know I, I jotted down this morning sort of three possible sort of recommendations as to how we can move forward from this situation where you know countering violent extremism, at least the government-led countering violent extremism seems to be less about countering a viable threat and more about sort of consolidating um, authoritarian power, particularly in the first thing, and it's very difficult for us to do that, is to sort of push forward a debate and try and keep on encouraging everyone to think about the differences between Yakin Inkar and ISIS, for example, or the IRPT and ISIS, the differences between nonviolent and violent extremism, the differences between sort of um, societal Islamization and political radicalization, ultimately with the view, which is never going to happen, of decriminalizing extremism um, within domestic legislation. I think something that's more realistic and something that's already happening is shifting the focus to uh, the 900 and, sorry, 9,999 in every 10,000 who didn't go to Syria and Iraq, right? who, who haven't joined terrorist organizations, focusing instead on sort of framing our programs in positive ways. Right? So um, back when I was sort of working in civil society in Tajikistan 10 years ago, I think that was really the beginning, sort of it was pre pre-Syria and Iraq, but uh, that was the beginning of sort of a number of major international organizations starting to work in CBD. That was a time in Tajikistan where we were moving from a peace-building narrative, civil war ending in 97, to a sort of suddenly the new thread is sort of violent extremism, terrorism. And at that time I was at a conference uh, organized by an international organization, and one of the young uh, Tajik participants um, from in the south of the country, stood up and said, you know, why are we talking about young extremism? I don't see any extremism in my community. Why aren't we talking about framing our programming in terms of youth and hope, and, you know, positivity, and, you know, giving us opportunities to, um, you know, realize our potential. And I think, you know, framing our programming around concepts of tolerance, diversity, trust, and dialogue, and resiliency, you know, is, is certainly the way to go, as opposed to, as opposed to sort of securitizing certain communities and creating incentives, which we have, I think there's a great report by Safer World on programming in Kyrgyzstan that you should all read if you're interested in this topic, where the authors really make a very convincing argument that <coughs> local NGOs are being sort of convinced to frame their programming. If it's about water management, if it's about environmental degradation, if it's about migration, you know, spin it in a way that's related to CBE and you'll get real, you'll bring in the dollars or euros, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that was, and I, I myself did when I was working uh, 
um, for, uh, for, for my organization in Tajikistan. You know, um, I think there are, there are positive incentives there to hype the threat, to securitize um, issues such as you know, rising uh, interest in Islam you know, as, a, as a way to sort of uh, generate interest from the donors. Um, so I think it's sort of you know, about trying to see all of that and trying to not incentivize that sort of behavior, although it is very difficult given the, the restrictions and, and, the, and, uh, and sort of the, the priorities of, of, of the administration here, for example. Um, and last, sort of a more macro level point, I guess, is sort of continuing to move towards a more demand-driven locally locally organized sort of programming, and I think that's something that we're, we're doing in various programs that Noah and I have um, are working on now, sort of listening to concerns of um, local, uh, local leaders, local members of civil society, local citizens, and you know, developing programs that may have the effect of countering violent extremism, although that's very difficult to measure someone's non-behavior, right? um, but ultimately will we'll, we'll benefit sort of and, and create sort of these ideas of sort of tolerance and, and trust within communities. So that's sort of the, the three thoughts that I had, and I think we can end there so we can have a discussion. Fantastic, and that's actually a, a great jumping off point. I will say before we open up the, the floor for questions and comment, I will use, or depending on your perspective, abuse my moderator's privilege to ask some of my own questions. And my first one is based off uh, your last point there about uh, demand-driven and local solutions. And, um, citing uh, some of your own research, not just you, but also Noah and uh, Marlene on this question here, where evidence exists of uh, a form of violent extremism originating from Central Asia is primarily first a, uh, the question of the individuals from Central Asian countries that traveled to Syria and Iraq to join Islamic State versus attacks. But then the other thing that some of your research has found is that it's an intensely local problem. If you look at the share of foreign fighters from an individual country like Uzbekistan or from around local areas, um, I'll bring up the example of uh, Jez Kazakhstan in uh, Kazakhstan, which you've uh, presented on, uh, I think, before, as well as uh, Arabon in Kyrgyzstan, uh, where these single local areas make up a large percentage of the total number, or individuals from these areas make up a large percentage of the share. Looking at it from the other side of this demand, from the perspective of international actors, from uh, actors who are involved in the region, uh, which types of actors within these communities or uh, more local actors uh, are playing a role in sort of uh, determining some of the course of action moving forward? And what's the best way uh, from an international perspective, looking at it from a 20,000 foot view, uh, is it best to sort of look at some of the localization of this issue? Okay, am I nominated? All right. Um, well, I think this this is a really good question, and um, it has been helpful. Uh, it's been helpful to talk about this, and and been helpful to to meet with several other people. In, last couple of days to, to, I guess, sort of inject some new perspective in, into this um, for me. And I, um, so I have to credit on this, um, in, in particular, uh, Kaylee Nash, who's a fellow at, at USCID right now, and the, um, the importance of considering power dynamics in these things, and, and of as you mentioned, because you, we have specific localized areas where we clearly have some sort of problem, one of, one of these problems in getting at what is happening in these places is that first we have to, if we say that, you know, if an awful lot of people, say, from Jez Kazgan leave and take their families and go to live in Syria or join, go to join the Islamic State and we consider that they are um, they're fully rejecting, you know, the, the possibilities that they have for becoming part of like the Kazakh national project or the Kazakh, the Kazakh dream for what it means to live in independent Kazakhstan. I think it's a fair assumption, and particularly if we listen to them, you know, this is, we hear this very quickly, that part of the reason that they are rejecting that is because they, not just because they don't feel like it represents their own values or their own goals, but also because they feel excluded from it. And the only way to get at 
people who feel excluded and are excluded, particularly by a power dynamic, is to listen to them tell their own story for these things. Because so often um, what we're going to have are, you know, you go to Bishkek and oftentimes going as an outside researcher who comes for a short time or working for an international organization, you get flown into a country for a week, you know, your job is basically to go around and talk to the experts who are in Bishkek or in Almaty or who are in Dushanbe. And um, we make this sort of assumption that they're going out and doing field work and that they're giving us, if they're concerned about Yachin and Kar in the rural parts of Chui province, that they must have gone there, you know, and looked at this and talked to these people and asked them, why don't you watch television? Why don't you send your children to school? You know, what is this that you are, are you sabotaging our national project or do you just feel that you, they're not going to teach your children anything that's useful, or was your child getting bullied? Or, you know, what are all of these things? That, but in, within that kind of power dynamic, especially if people already feel like they're being discriminated against, if we only listen to the people on the positive side of the power dynamic, the ones who are perceived as the oppressors, or not, not necessarily oppressors, we don't want to, to qualify it in that way, but the people who are who have the power and who have the resources rather than the people who feel that they are being denied them, um, then I think oftentimes we're, we're getting a very skewed version of it and we're getting a version of things that um, doesn't look very much like what the experience of these people who are making these really radical decisions to, to bring their small children to go live in the Islamic State um, in Iraq. This is a truly radical decision. And we can say, well, those people are just crazy, or they're poorly informed, or they've been hypnotized, or whatever else, which is generally what people say when they're asked to explain these things. But that's, that's the perspective of the, the strong side of the power dynamic. That's, well, if you make a choice like that, you must be crazy. And it doesn't see that that other person's experience may be so radically different than yours that this actually seems like a sensible and rational choice to them. It doesn't mean that it is one. They're making a terrible mistake. And many of them are paying for it with their lives and with their children's lives. And so we should agree that we all want to prevent this from happening. But I don't think we can design effective programs that do that without getting there and talking to them and finding out what their perspective on this is. And that's something that is quite difficult to do in a lot of cases. Well, I think you're right in, in framing the program, sort of framing the sort of reasoning why individuals went to Syria and Iraq, you know, as being sort of related to, they were pulled in through their networks, right, either, either online or, or offline, <coughs> or in various cases in, in just as young in Kazakhstan, um, in, uh, certain villages in northern Tajikistan where, you know, entire extended families, um, members of sort of the same sort of uh, class of school departed to Syria uh, and Iraq together. And I think that's you know, it's very difficult to sort of pro, sort of ad address those sort of concerns and to create programs to um, to address those issues, as, as Noah said, without sort of reaching out to those communities that have been securitized and those communities that have been uh, sort of labeled as excluded by the government. Fantastic. And I guess on the on the flip side of that, and now this is the the hot button issue now is. Um, uh, citizens of Central Asian countries are uh, detained in Syria and Iraq, uh, and there have been some efforts, I believe, the, the Tajik government most recently, uh, to bring back uh, citizens from Syria and Iraq. Do we know anything about what types of policies are in place on behalf of the various governments in terms of reintegration, rehabilitation? And I know, obviously, the, the policy landscape in some of these countries is different, but it's worth pointing out as well is that as the United States and Europe uh, make their own determinations about what to do, do with their citizens uh, that are now being held in uh, SDF-controlled camps or uh, by other actors in Syria and Iraq as well. And sometimes pointing to uh, Central Asian countries or to Russia or to the other countries that have brought back uh, their citizens uh, as a uh, evidence for either for or against the policy debate. How should uh, the development of these types of programs play into the way that we think about this as a, a top-level policy discussion here in the United States or in Europe. I can certainly speak to the, the Tajik case, as you said, in 2015, I think it was, Tajikistan introduced a, a law, an amnesty law, or a, 
um, whereby they would amnesty uh, individuals who repented who returned from Syria and Iraq. And I think you know, you could trust the government figures. Some hundred individuals have taken advantage of that, um, and then there've been various moves uh, to bring back um, women and children um, from detention or uh, refugee camps in Syria and Iraq. Although not all, uh, not not everyone has consented to come. Um, my understanding is that those individuals have been nominally allowed to go free, but obviously under the close, close scrutiny of the security services. And there's no sort of rehabilitation program, to my knowledge, in place, um, either for those who've been amnestied, or maybe more importantly, for the children who've come back, who've obviously seen very horrific things and been taught, um, uh, taught you know, sort of where violence has been normalized and legitimized and, and, and taught to be a good thing to do. That's, that's my understanding of the tragic case, and you know I can speak to the Kazakh. Um, I think, well, briefly, Kazakhstan, um, I think, gets a lot of credit, uh, or deserves a, well, quite a bit of credit, for being um, for being on sort of the leading edge for this in, in Central Asia, in particular, about trying to repatriate families and um, and um, socializing from the very top. That um, we have an obligation to children. And Kazakhstan has a is an unusual case in particular um, because the number of children who ended up in Syria and Iraq um, was significantly higher than adults. Um, I don't remember the exact figures, um, but it's I think it's three to one or four to one, and if it, if you include women and children, I think it was five to one. Um, it's so severely by children by the age of like under eighteen. So it's children who did not, you know, not sixteen year olds who Others. went to go fight, but I mean small children even. Um, and there are since a lot of Kazakhs um, went with their wives um, around 2013 and 2014. A lot of them had additional children while they were living in Syria and Iraq, and so then this creates a, a huge mess from a diplomatic um, and citizenship <coughs> perspective uh, where what documents do these children have? Many of them don't have birth certificates even. Um, so it takes a real, um, it takes a great deal of proactiveness on the part of a government to create birth certificates and create citizen document. Uh, citizen documentation for for children you really have to make an effort to bring them back it's not going to happen by itself and um, I think Kazakhstan deserves a lot of credit for um, for taking um, a lot of initiative on this and, and bringing back um, at least around a hundred um, women and children but there is there are huge questions that remain about what how do you reintegrate them afterwards and what sort of help um, do we give particularly to children who are exposed to violence for long periods? Um, and I think they're they're taking it quite seriously and want to do whatever they can to help them, but I but are maybe not entirely sure what to do. And there are some legal limitations about providing psychological counseling to children without the permission of their parents and things like this. So there are a lot of um, a lot of very thorny details that have to be worked out, but. Um, the political will is sort of the is the first thing that, that we have to reach for this and um, in most countries for most of the time there has been close to zero political will for this unfortunately so hopefully we'll see that begin to change fantastic uh, at this point we'll open up the floor for questions uh, we'll start in the front up here if you can also say your name and affiliation before the question just so we have a sense of I'm uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an intelligence analyst, uh, a former diplomat. The one thing that I see missing in this space is organizations evolving within the Islamic context, independent of the government, who want to stand up and say, this is not today's Islam, uh, and, and then aggressively gather the ulema to come out with positions that are then kind of forced across the space within each of these countries. Do um, you guys see any of that? I don't. Um, 
in none of the Central Asian countries, including Kyrgyzstan, are Islamic scholars allowed to do things like that. That's great. It's, it is. <laughs> this is not a, it's not a, um, there are lots of ways, there are many, many people who would be willing to take a very active role in this. Because this is one of the other things about Central Asia that we should mention, I think Ed has, has often mentioned well, is that there is overwhelming social opposition to these things in Central Asia. Um, it's really overwhelming. Um, and there is overwhelming opposition in the Muslim community to these things, but their hands are tied. Um, they are not allowed to produce positions on their own. They're not allowed to make statements. In Uzbekistan, they're not even allowed to write their own sermons, or in Tajikistan either. So the idea that you could gather together voluntarily on, a con on something that you care about, even something as positive as this, and you know, issue a fatwa or something like this, is, it's the kind of thing that will get you put in prison, unfortunately. The case this brings to mind is the Tajik Kogsnik Koji Mirza, who is a very sort of prominent mm. sort of Tajik cleric, was formerly sort of part of an, an officialist imam and then subsequently lost his position but continues to be very influential. Um, he got in a sort of online war with uh, one of the leading sort of uh, Tajik fighters in Syria and Iraq, and he was sort of, you know, making various sort of uh, religious based arguments against that individual, and, they, and that, that got a lot of play on the social media. So I, I think there's certainly a, a willingness, and I've mm -hmm. seen certain evidence from, from various clerics, most of whom are now based outside of the country, but continue to have a very relatively large social media following. You know, some of them are addressing these issues, um, but mm -hmm. the, the official, the imams within the official context obviously put out statements that, 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 that do make the argument that this is against Islam, um, but that's obviously sanctioned by international law which is there in each country. So I think, I think there, there's certainly an effort to make religious-based arguments against against this. Well, actually, let's collect a couple questions. We'll start here and then go here. Uh, thank you very much. Great presentations. Very uh, interesting points. Uh, my name is Bob Safar. I'm in uh, Central Asia Consulting. So uh, the number of uh, attacks that's happening in, in Afghanistan, like, it's increasing, you know? Do you think it's somehow related to Syria because, you know, Obviously, ISIS is down there. They be, uh, you know, they moved to Afghanistan. So, and there is any figure where those people that went there, you know, the children that are returning, are they killed? Or like, how many of them? Or where are they? These people, you know, if you have any information. Also, quickly take this question. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jenny. I'm an international visitor from Kyrgyzstan. Since you mentioned a couple of former world countries, I have to give the comments. First of all, I've been already in the United States for almost a month, and um, I uh, met with different political people, business, and so on. I really appreciate that there's still this group of scholars and studying in Central Asia, because I, I understand it is really out of the interest of most of the American people. Um, but my question is, um, soon in Bishkek, in June, there will be Shanghai Cooperation Organization, issued out by China. Uh, the initial mission of this organization is also to uh, tackle this uh, kind of extremism, religion. I would like to get your assessment how effective this organization has been running in Central Asia. And before I close in my question, I would like to make a comment, uh, Dr. Malin. Uh, you said like uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, it is uh, not really kind of democratic, but it is like more weak authoritative. It is not about my patriotism. I really wanted to found like the key present difference from the most of the Central Asian country, it is because of our democratic institutions. Yes, I do admit that our president and some government political leaders, they may have present some kind of authoritative manners. However, those kind of people usually that be removed or be opposite by our institutions. And we have freedom of speech, we have meetings and demonstrations. I just being now in uh, United States, I signed a petition against this kind of uh, mining the uranium. And pr president just four days ago said, we're gonna like stop doing this, for example. We also have political pluralism, competitive election. We changed transform from the presidential uh, parliament now to representative parliament. So this will never ever happen in authoritative country, even the weakest authoritative country. So I really hope, like, I understand we still have a long journey to go, 
but I do real appreciate if the Western community can give the credit to our government, to our country, society, for defending these principles, democratic institutions. Thank you so much. Let's start with those and then we take one other question. Actually, so small. Sure, yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> I, can, I can certainly go with, with Buck's question. Um, and, and I guess Noah sort of can build on maybe some of the movement that Buck arises. I think we've seen um, some reports of groups, I think there was people in Imam Bukhari, Jamawat, who moved some fighters mm -hmm. over, I think, last year or the year before from Syria and Iraq, or only one brigade, a few hundred individuals. So there, there has been some, obviously, divergence um, of, or diverting of uh, groups within Syria to often join sort of Islamic State and Khorasan province. Um, and there have been reports, particularly of uh, Tajiks, um, I'm not sure about the, the other countries, but certainly of around a dozen or maybe two dozen Tajiks who were diverted. Instead of going to Syria and Iraq, they were diverted through Iran um, and across the border into Afghanistan. So there's certainly, there's been, you know, reports of, and, and ISKP's propaganda certainly tries to repeat the sort of messaging and um, the sort of, sort of uh, uh, you know, impressive visuals and, and, and that, uh, you know, its original organization in Syria produced, but I don't think we've seen the same, obviously, level of recruitment in the thousands that we saw at the height of, of ISIS and of, sort of, of Syria and Iraq um, sort of in the 2014, 2015 period. So I think there certainly are, there are individuals, and there's, you know, I think the best or the most sort of authoritative book on ISIS in Afghanistan is probably Al Hussein Nabeel's trilogy, an interesting little book back in the end of the um, and that sort of breaks down sort of the organization within Afghanistan. But it certainly hasn't had the same appeal that, that ISIS has for, for the better reason. Um, and in terms of the Shanghai Corporation Organization, um, I didn't mention the sort of similarities between the Russian law and its Convention on Counter Extremism, which is 2017. It's 9% um, in terms of the sort of definition of extremism. So I think, you know, the, the, these three evils, which are extremism, separatism, and, uh, and terrorism, I think um, you do see some of the, the Russian influence in terms of framing the, this definition of extremism very broad and draws on the different themes that I see. In terms of the effectiveness, it obviously has the unfortunately named RAPS based in the regional anti-terrorism structure based in, based in Tashkent. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, it's grown. I don't have the figures here, but I uh, was on the panel with Noah in Oxford last week and I had the figures to hand, but certainly list of extremist organizations has like grown massively. Um, and by way of sort of mutual recognition, technically, if you're arrested, um, if you're a member of the Islamic Renaissance Party, for example, which is on their list of terrorist organizations, and you're arrested in, in, in Russia, for example, um, or if you set foot into Russia, then technically, you know, you'll be recognized as a terrorist uh, within, sort of within Russia. So I think it's, I think it's, it's been a way for um, the, re the region's governments to adopt this approach to CVE that is very sort of focused on sort of uh, consolidating regime security. And it's a way for them to cooperate on that and to sort of allow them to um, place certain restrictions on, on different political opponents. So I think it's been effective from the perspective, to some degree from the perspective of maintaining authoritarian regimes within the region, maybe with the, with the exception uh, to some degree of, of, of Kyrgyzstan, which I think is certainly, um, I don't work on Kyrgyzstan and I always say that because it's, it's too confusing and there are too many political parties and I prefer sort of authoritarian <laughs> states where things are a little... Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah, some additional comments on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I think it mostly works as a kind of socializing place for all these regimes, right? In terms of action on the ground, they are very limited, and the rats is probably one of their main uh, um, uh, concrete action on the ground, but I don't see it as being positive, right? Exactly for the reason Ed mentioned, that is in fact it's about regime security. So. It's exactly the counter example of what you don't want to do, which is to conflate political opposition and extremism, to identify every opponent uh, uh, for your own regime security as being an extremist, in criminalizing everything. And I think that what China is now doing with these mass uh, uh, internment camps for uh, uh, Uyghurs and other uh, uh, Central Asian nation living in in Pyongyang is exactly the counter example of what you want to do because that the backlash will be there for sure. So, so I think the, these new actions of China 
we the camp he just totally delegitimizing what the Shanghai Cooperation Organization could be doing because it's just a kind of open massive repression that will backlash. I defer to everything my colleagues said on this. We can take more questions. Fantastic. Any other questions? Go back there. Yeah, uh, just two questions. Minister Dean of uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kevin Tepelo at George W. Uh, <clears throat> so one question uh, about the um, internal dynamics within the Muslim community itself. Because uh, genuinely they are portrayed as a fairly kind of homogeneous group, victimized as a group. So, um, for example, yeah, uh, the would be interesting to know that um, the major sort of pressure on uh, Tablighi Jamaat in the early 2010s was from the uh, director of the State Committee on Religious Affairs, who was a graduate of the al Azhar University, yeah, and had um, particularly strong kind of his own perspective on um, Tablighi Jamaat. And then the other reason I mean, why, for example, Yakin and Kar was uh, banned yeah, is because Murtiyat, uh, which is significantly represented by Tablighi Jamaat, did not take a stand defending Tablighi Jamaat or Yakin and Kar, because Tablighi Jamaat and Yakin and Kar had difficult relations with each other, right? Um, and so, like, what are you gonna, and then my Tajik colleagues, for example, share how uh, many of these policies on religion are shaped by um, members of the government who are also uh, belong to the Salafi um, community, right? So what is the role of these internal kind of dynamics? And the second question is about um, kind of the resilience of the um, community itself and the longevity of the radicalization programs and projects, right? Because um, if you look back in like five years ago, um, nobody was talking about radicalization. All, every, all kind of development projects were about um, uh, mediating conflict, uh, and, and so the, all the money was there, you know? So the question is how long do you think um, this radicalization discourse and money you know, on radicalization project are going to uh, come to the region and how long they are going to last? And, um, and what will come after that? Yeah, sure. yeah. Right. Another question. Yeah, Marley, could you expand on what you said about the stance of the Central Asian states on the Uyghurs, yeah. the Uyghur extremism? Yeah. Um, just to that first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a, a point on, on uh, Emil's second question on this longevity. I think it's a key element of the problems and I see globally the Western kind of NGO action in, in the region has been detrimental mm -hmm. and harm I mean harmful to the region because it's came with this kind because it's too much based on this kind of DC style ecosystem where suddenly you have bubble of topics that are trendy on which you can create kind of generate money, get grants and then apply them in the region and then a few years after the context has changed here. And then suddenly the bubble disappeared and you have a new bubble arriving. And then when you see that from the region, it's, it just looks so illogical, right? So, so that really give you know, this kind of criticism that is coming from the region toward the way that I think is a legitimate one, in that we are totally kind of irregular in what we are trying to offer and to build with the region. And we are sending messaging that are really confusing about what are the priorities. And I think on that, this is a global discussion that has to do with the way here we have this kind of ecosystem of fund topics arriving and dis disappearing very fast. So I think it's, it's a very important point. And I think for communities or for local uh, uh, NGO people in the region, it's very difficult to suddenly seeing a lot of Western money arriving on that issue and then five years after it disappeared. And so if you are an NGO activist, you suddenly feel, do I have to shift my interest, is that do, do I want to stay loyal to the topics I care or do I want to follow the funds, right? So that I think on that we, we have a, 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 an important responsibility. Uh, uh, on the uh, uh, Uyghurs, well, the, 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 the Central Asian state, because they are a member of the Shanghai Orga uh, Cooperation Organization, has been following usually the traditional kind of China-centric definition of what is the Uyghur's problem. You cannot, they couldn't afford any kind of autonomy in narrative. So they for very long have been sharing the fact that they want, you know, uh, to be sure that, that uh, uh, any kind of, so the three evils uh, narrative was officially reproduced by Central Asian regimes. 
with what is happening now, you can see that it's becoming more and more difficult for some of these countries, and especially for Kazakhstan, because it's the one that had the biggest Uyghur uh, minority, about 300,000 uh, people, is suddenly feeling in difficulties maintaining this kind of stance. At the same time, given the differential of power, it would be very difficult to imagine that Kazakhstan could suddenly stand up against China to defend the Uyghurs. I mean, we are not doing it very well here, so there is no reason if the West is not <laughs> really fighting China on that issue that we can ask the Central Asian states, mm -hmm. which are weak and close to China, to be able to do that. So my understanding is that Kazakhstan has been trying to develop a kind of very discreet shadow paradiplomacy in trying to discuss with China, not about the Uyghurs, because that I think it's, it's unmanageable if it's not a huge kind of Western pressure, but about the Kazakhs mm -hmm. in China who have been in camp and trying to say, well, on this one, we would like to put some pressure and try to see if we can help them, if you could send them to Kazakhstan and so on, but that's more or less the only thing they can do. And some them. money may be, may be changing hands there. Mm -hmm. Some money may be changing hands there. Mm -hmm. So, so that I think is a, is a, I mean, if it's, it's the Central Asian states are too weak toward China to be able to really stand for, for Uyghur. So at the base, they can try to stand, stand for their own ethnic uh, fellows who are in camp, but not much more than that. But it's powerful enough to prevent Uyghur extremism and violence within their own country, cross-border attacks or something like that. Well, there have been no. none. The Uyghur community in Kazakhstan is a very well integrated uh, community. They do a lot of, uh, uh, they have their own kind of business world. They have people helping the communities. <coughs> they are very devoted to Kazakhstan. They are very kind of patriot of Kazakhstan. So there is no kind of trans border activities except feeling sorry for what is happening to Uyghurs in the region. So the real backlash will happen in Xinjiang when, because when they are in order, all these people will be out of camp and then you don't know who they will become once they will be released, released, right? Um, so, Emil, I hope we'll get a chance to talk for a while after this because I'm really eager to hear more about your perspective on, on these things and, and you know this um, better than I do. Um, no comparison. Um, particular to Kyrgyzstan, but I, I do, I think you are, this is to say, I think you're exactly right, that it's very important to look at political context, political personalities in how these specific policies are formed. And we see this not just in Kyrgyzstan, but in, in, in other places as well. And this is why um, I would sort of make an argument, if we can take this, if we put this to a useful policy perspective, I would suggest that this is in the West, in, in Europe, in the United States, where we developed this idea of secularism and state secularism. We did it at, as, a, as a result of hundreds of years of this same thing, of falling over, as you say in Russian, stepping on the same rake over and over again and, and ending up you know, with tragedies like the Thirty Years' War and you know, all of these things they did. I, we, we have, in Europe in particular, they have just a, had for hundreds of years a horrible record on politicizing religion and Catholic versus Protestant identity. And um, so it's not that we came to this idea of state secularism and removing this from the equation because we're so smart or philosophically advanced. We learned it on the blood and bodies of hundreds of thousands of people who were killed in religious wars over these things. And so I think I would invite um, our Central Asian partners to learn from our mistakes in this case and say that um, state secularism doesn't mean that the state is against religion or that the state has to be, that people who work for the state cannot be religious. The idea is that we have to remove these questions from politics entirely. We can't favor one religious group because the mufti is a member of it, or the mayor of Bishkek is a member of it, or the, the president is, is this or that. We have to treat them all equally and, and uh, expect them to abide by the laws and expect them to respect you know, the other communities. As long as they do that, as long as they don't behave violently against others, they get to believe whatever it is that they want to believe, no matter how strange we think it is. And this is important because you will always end up having no matter how weird or offensive you may find the other person's beliefs, 
you will eventually have a mayor or a governor or a president who is one of those things and then he may act on behalf of his group or against the other groups. So we just have to cancel it all and say everybody is equal under the law and that's the terrible lesson um, that we've learned. And I, I think it's certainly not surprising that in that a very young states would struggle with these problems, you know. And, and so I would, my, the perspective that I try to advance from this is the learn from our costly mistakes rather than listen to us lecture you. Um, the question about resiliency of this CVE, PVE approach to development, I think Marlene hit it exactly right. This is the flavor of now in DC or in the international donor community. I'm grateful for it in some ways because it means that I, you know, people Google terrorism in Central Asia and they find my name and they invite me to conferences and you know things like this. So in, in some ways, I can't complain about it. I'm glad that people are paying attention to it. I'm flattered that I get asked about these things. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I think we, we run the risk, a, a huge risk, in improperly understanding the actual problems if we, keep, if, if we just keep applying a different frame to it every couple of years. Um, that's, that's just bad research, and, and it's a bad foundation for policy. Yeah, and just to build off that, I guess, to sort of the, the, the what next, I guess, I think we're already seeing within DC with this administration, sort of in terms of the security interest globally, but particularly in a region like Central Asia, given its geopolitical position, right? Uh, a shift from terrorism that's fallen down the NSA, you know, national security strategy and the national defense strategy, right? And the new thing is strategic competitors, um, authoritarian influence of Russia and China in particular, right? So I think um, we're going to, and I've already seen certain evidence um, that, more money into those sort of activities, how that more manifests itself in terms of development programming um, remains to be seen, but I think that's the sort of, that's the trend in terms of the way that, the, 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 at least the emphasis that's being placed from the U.S. national security interest in the region, right, I would, I, I would say. Um, but who knows how long that'll last, and then depending on, on administrations, you know, then something, something else may on that, I'll look towards the future note. I can find uh, no better place, especially since we're running up against time uh, to conclude. Thank you all so much for coming. Please join me in uh, thanking all of our presenters.